Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming out this afternoon. My name is Ed Caprelli, and um, I am from Delaware. I am the owner operator of Riverside Native Trees, which is a uh, native tree nursery. We're up in Radnor. It's like 25 miles uh, from here. Um, a couple, of, there's uh, some contact information here. Uh, Riverside Native Trees uh, is my website. Um, we created another one to try and uh, gather all the local yokels, all the little small people that I consider myself one of them as well, in, uh, into a group called ohionativegrowers.org. There's other people there. Uh, there's maybe 12 people. There's a mapping function there. And um, if, you, if you know Gail up at Natives in Harmony or Patty Shipley at uh, Leaves for Wildlife and Sunbury, they're listed there. And there's some other uh, people all over the state. If you know of anyone who has a small operation, uh, who's doing natives or mostly natives, then they are welcome to join. It costs $20 and uh, we have to put their pictures and their contact information and all that other stuff up there. And um, there is a third, um, there's a third website called uh, Riverside Native Perennials. That's our newest business. Uh, we started essentially, well, essentially like a, a year ago yesterday, we, we sowed our first seeds and uh, they came up and we overwintered them. And then we uh, grew some more this spring. Um, we were growing native perennials and uh, mostly what we've grown is uh, material for farmers for CRP and CRP being uh, the program where they uh, pay farmers not to farm, uh, let that ground lie fallow, and they have to plant, in general, a flat of plants every year during their, um, uh, during their, their contract period. And a flat for us is maybe 32 plants. And, um, and so uh, we also just shipped some plants yesterday up to the national parks. Uh, we have a very good relationship with them. They're really terrific to us. And uh, they took 5,000 uh, little we call them plugs and um, uh, for their, for their uh, visitor center, brand new visitor center. So uh, some of our stuff's gonna be in their very, uh, very forefront of their, uh, of their public image. So um, let's see, uh, this is essentially what we do. Uh, this, is, this is some one, this just be a short, uh, just a small example of our product. Um, we grow in a in a three gallon in a three gallon container. As you can see here, each one of those containers is irrigated, and um, and so this these are two year old oak trees, and so um, we can get we can get those trees up there uh, pretty quick. Um, they would start in a greenhouse, and if you have friends like I do that own an ultralight. So they fly over from time to time, just give you an idea what the whole thing looks like. And so right now, this is, this, this picture is a little older. This is the main greenhouse. This is where we would, um, this is where we would have our uh, uh, seedling trees. There's now a greenhouse right here. That's uh, uh, perennials. And then there's another greenhouse right here a brand new one, it's I'm three weeks old, a 30 by 100 that the Amish built for us uh, that's filled with perennials. We are having an open house this Saturday from 10 to 3, and we're trying to move stuff. Everything on in the, in the nursery is essentially for sale unless it's flagged. And uh, we have just, there's an easy 10,000 trees there and another, I don't even know, probably another 5,000, 8,000 uh, perennials in different sized containers. So, so that's, uh, that's what we do. Um, and so what I, what I was hoping to just talk with you about today is um, just some ideas about care of trees, uh, what to do with them if you were to buy some, not necessarily from me, but these would apply to all the trees that you would get at any of the, the big box stores or some of the local nurseries and stuff like that. But um, I found some really great pictures. Uh, and so you can learn a lot from the forest. And in, the, in a healthy forest, there's a lot of stuff that's going on here. Uh, there's nutrient cycling, there's critters that are eating leaves, their droppings are falling to the ground, the, 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 that material is breaking down, nutrients are being released. And so currently, 
if this was your yard, and to me, this is what I shoot for, is to have something like this. So when I walk out my front door, this is what it looks like. And it doesn't, but, and it won't, but that's what I hope for. That's what I shoot for. Um, we, as people, we have broken a lot of these nutrient cycles. And so as a result, you and I have to supplement with nutrition in order to get these plants going, in order to try and simulate, if you will, that nutrient cycling. And so I am a proponent of using fertilizer uh, to supplement their growth just because there isn't enough fertilizer in the ground as it stands to promote the rapid growth that, that, that some of these trees have. I mean, this, we go back here, these are two-year-old oaks and they're bigger than you are, okay? They're huge, they're huge. And so this could be, these could be pin oaks or not. Uh, I can't, this, this is a nuttall oak. It's a more southerly species of oak. We don't carry it now because it's really not native to Ohio, but we could have uh, bur oaks that big. We could have swamp white oaks that big in two years, red oaks that big, um, uh, pin oaks that big. For us, oaks are about the fastest growing trees we have. And so um, you may have heard that oaks are slow. They're not provided you fertilize them. If you don't fertilize them, yes, they're gonna be really, really slow. And we'll talk a little bit more about fertilization as we go on. But I wanna, again, just emphasize that uh, there's a lot of processes that are going on here. There's a nitrogen cycle, there's a phosphorus cycle. All of the major elements have a cyclical nature where they're used and then recycled again and again, and hopefully not lost to the environment. There's a water cycle, as you're, as you're familiar with. It's a complex thing, and uh, this, this is going on in, in natural areas. Do you remember this? Oh man, this is terrible. This is enough to give you uh, uh, scary memories from high school biology. I used to have to teach this. That's even worse. And so this is photosynthesis and respiration. And I just wanted to throw that up there to say, hey, it's a pretty complex thing going on out there that we just take for granted that gives us oxygen and uses our carbon dioxide um, uh, in a, on a daily basis. So enough of that, Oof, scary. So. When you have an opportunity re to replace a tree, our suggestion would be to go with a native tree. And so replace natives with natives. And for us, native trees are trees from seeds that are within about a 250 mile radius uh, of our area. And so some people are a little bit more militant about that. I've had people ask for within 50 miles. And for us, that's okay because I do most of our collecting. I don't range too much further than, you know, for us, Marion County or down to Franklin County or out to, I'll go out to Plain City. And so all that stuff is within that 50 mile radius, but 250 miles is, is a pretty good benchmark as well. And so for, for us, being as centrally located as we are, this gets me, if I wanted, seeds clear from Western Pennsylvania down into Tennessee, over into Indiana, and up into Southern Michigan. And so that 250 mile radius is, is pretty broad. And it does encompass a lot of uh, geographical, different geographical areas, different, not so much biomes, but different habitats where some of these uh, more interesting plants are found. So, so what I wanna stress with you today is this, is just looking or working uh, within uh, with uh, local provenance seed sources. And again, that's our 250 mile radius. So it does make a difference. It does make a difference. And we've seen that in the nursery. Uh, several years ago, I picked up some, uh, they're essentially red oak acorns. I was down in, uh, I was down in Mississippi. They were just falling in a parking lot. I thought, I'm gonna scoop these up and grow them. They were still green in the greenhouse in December. All right, they looked, great in December until we had a really hard freeze, then they were done. And that's not what you want to have happen with your trees here in central Ohio. You want them to be essentially leafless by the time winter uh, kicks in. And these trees were still green, uh, like I said, in early December. And so 
those differences, those are genetic differences, and they are manifested uh, by the tree coming out earlier, which if we have a late frost or even an early frost, they're gonna get zapped and they drop their leaves later. So I just like this picture, it's lovely, they're succulents. And I put this up here to, to just to say this, diversity is important. And so we've seen the ravages of the emerald ash borer. And so, and as you well know, the emerald ash borer attacks ashes and we've had tons of ashes. I was unfortunately well positioned to help people with native trees when the emerald ash borer came through. And so if you increase the diversity of your trees on your property, then we don't have, like some people have come to me and have said, oh, we've had like 30 ash trees that we've had to have cut down. You know, if you have some oaks in there, we don't have the emerald oak borer yet, if there is such a thing, or the emerald maple borer, if there is such a thing, which we're thankful for. But if we increase the diversity, we then sort of spread the, um, oh, spread the, no, it's not spread the wealth, it's spread the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, spread the what? Risk. Yes, thank you, you spread the risk, thank you. You spread the risk around a little bit. And so, uh, which is helpful. And also for us, one of the big things, I have some fantastic pictures here towards the end. One of the things that we're trying to do by using local provenance seed and growing local provenance trees is to provide food for herbivores, uh, specifically insects, caterpillars. We want caterpillars. And so by increasing your diversity, you stand a much better chance, of course, you're offering them the sort of the corn cornucopia of food Instead of just that one ash tree, if you have caterpillars that don't eat ash, you're not going to get that moth in your yard. However, if you have some oaks and some maples and some others in there, you, you can stand the chance of, of getting them. And what we have found in the nursery is that if you grow it, they will find it. They will come. And we have some just some remarkably humongous uh, insects that eat on this, um, that feed on these plants. So in your home landscape, what we tell people is to emphasize oaks. And there's a lot of oaks out there to choose from, namely pins and swamps and burrs and shingles and shoemards. All of these are oaks. And oaks are just relished by tons of different insects. And so of course, in Ptolemy's book, uh, Bringing Nature Home, which uh, a lot of people have read, a lot of people are at least familiar with them, hundreds and hundreds of species uh, use oaks, uh, either as uh, a home place, food source, shelter, uh, a very, very important tree. In fact, perhaps uh, the most important tree that's out there. It's a hardwood, it's valuable to you in your, uh, in your home landscape, and they're just, they're just magnificent trees. Uh, our personal favorite, the one that just grows so great for us, uh, is this. It's just one of those. Oh, it's so beautiful. It doesn't have much of a fall color. It's sort of muddy brown, but it has a fabulous bark to it that's deeply furrowed. The new leaves that come out are lime green with a tinge of purple to them. And so they get a big honk and acorn on them that the animals like. Uh, you might not like that for, you know, grass cutting purposes. Um, but uh, another fabulous one right here, shake a pin. It's little jelly bean sized um, acorns. And so they're dark, they're almost black. Uh, something that's uh, large enough that even a blue jay can choke it down. And so in the, in the fall, you can sort of tell where those trees are at because the blue jays are up there eating the acorns before they drop. And so a magnificent, fast growing, again, fast, fast, fast. For us, eh, not so fast. Perhaps the fastest is this one right here, the Schumardo. 
beautiful rosy red in the fall. Oh, it's lovely, lovely. The red is fast. White and the black, they are slow. They are real slow for us. Chicken pit is fast. Post, they're just so rare. Uh, I, I just never found local a local seed source for them. And scarlets, uh, scarlets are are kind of slow, but the majority of them, the majority of them are fast. And the key to that speed lies with you, in that you've got the fertilizer. Yep, they want to grow. They they are like horses at the gate. They're ready to run, and they want to grow, and they want to grow big. And you want them to grow big so that the deer don't knock them over, the rabbits don't gnaw them down in the winter time. You've got to get some fertilizer on to push them. But yeah, these are all these would all be beautiful oaks uh, uh, in your yard. Uh, the first, oh yeah, the first four, the, the fall color, muddy brown, beautiful fall color. Beautiful fall color. This one I see purple. It's a purple fall color. Not much. Muddy brown. Muddy brown. Scarlet is another is a type of red oak. It has a it has a good fall color. So, but yeah, all of them are going to produce acorns. They generally don't produce acorns every year. It's certainly on a two or three to five year cycle. So uh, you know, just for uh, you know, grass cutting purposes. If, if you're thinking, oh, I'd love to have an oak, but I don't want all those darn acorns. It does. It generally doesn't happen every year. All right. So the best chance for success for you is in my opinion, and this is not just because this is what I grow, but the best chance for success for you is a small container grown plant. Not bald and burlap, not a big honking bald and burlap that you were going to pay $300 for at the nursery center. We, our plants, our most expensive plant is $59, and that's for a one inch bur oak. Well, I should say $79, that's for an inch and a quarter bur oak in a container. If you buy them as bald and burlap, there's, there's several problems. The biggest one is that most of the most of the roots are left back in the original nursery. In that ball, you think, well, shoot, all the roots are in there. They are not. And the study suggests that well over 80% of the roots are left back in the nursery. So that plant is damaged. With what we've got going on here at our nursery, most, if not all, the roots are in the bottom of that pot. They're in a special container. It actually prunes the roots as they grow. They have little holes in the sides of the pots. The roots grow out just a little bit and the sun and the wind dries the tip of that root off. It dies back just a little bit. And just like when you, you know, when you prune a branch, the branch is behind the prune, the root does the same thing for the same reason. And so we get a nice mop of roots in that pot and that increased root mass then promotes their, um, uh, their transplant success. So, um, in, in the spring, you go to your big box store. They've got tons of trees out there, real tall. They'll have some silver maples. They'll have some other ones in there. They'll be in a nice smooth-sided pot. They're ready to go. Those plants were just assembled before they got to you. And so what they do with those is that that plant is bare-rooted in the fall of the previous year. So in about mid-November, the big boys that are doing this kind of work out on the West Coast, they will pull all those trees out of the ground. They'll knock all the dirt off of them. They'll trim the roots back. And then they will be placed in a climate-controlled warehouse with no, no dirt on their roots until February. Then in February, they'll start to ship them out, truck them all over the United States. They'll go to a, a nursery. They'll put, them in the, they'll put them in a pot. They've got a big chute where, where mulch comes down, fill up that pot with mulch, next. Tree in the pot, fill it up with mulch, next. And so that tree, those trees with their damaged roots then are in that pot. And if they go for the whole summer, 
those roots are going to start to circle in there and you've got to fix that. I mean, if you get some of those, those end of the season bargains, if you will, you've got to fix that because those roots will never unwind. And so the, the key to that is just to take your, your pruners, sharp pair of pruners. And again, if you can imagine the bottom of the pot, the, the part that's sitting on the ground at 12, at eight and at four, take your pruners in there, snip, snip, snip at 12, eight and four. And then also I would take, and I'm not going in real deep, only just like right, right at the surface, take my pruners and go snipping right up the side of the pot, right up the side of the pot. At again, 12, eight and four, I'm breaking those roots. I'm cutting those roots. It's gonna set it back a little bit, but if you don't fix that, it'll never fix itself. And as those roots get fatter, it will, they will constrict the growth of the tree and you will strangle the tree in time. So it has to be fixed. If you cut those roots, new roots will grow from those cut ends out into the soil like they should. And so you've got to fix it. So your best chance for success, in my opinion, a small, small being three gallon to 10 gallon container grown tree um, and uh, not bald and burlapped and not, um, not bare rooted either. We, we sell bare rooted trees. And I, and, uh, I have a fellow who, who, who does that. We basically gave him the business and he's running with it. And we sell to people because they want bare rooted stuff because they're not even, you know, they're like a buck a piece. They're, you know, two foot tree, a buck a piece. Really they're very economical. But for us, they'll order on a Monday. He could potentially pull those out of the ground on a Tuesday and a Wednesday. They'd be ready in a couple of days. They don't sit outside for very long. And as long as the roots are kept, you know, cool and moist, uh, it generally works out. Generally works out pretty well. All right. So a couple of here's where we get into. We're gonna switch gears just a little bit. Here's where we get into uh, just your maintaining the tree. And um, we'd like to talk just a little bit, a bit about pruning and staking. And the, the trouble with trees is you've got to show them who the boss is because they want to grow crazy all over the place. All right. They want to sort of be like a shrub rather than a tree. Oddly enough, and when I get to heaven, I have to ask God this, but oddly enough, the side branches grow more vigorously on a tree than the leader does. And so you can get a tree that has a little stumpy leader, but real wide side branches. And so it looks crazy. You can't have that. That tree has lost what we call apical dominance. All right. And so you've got to fix that. And the way to fix that is to prune back those real wide ones. Give the tree basically a conical shape, a cone shape, like the tree, you know, like you would see out in the wild. And if you have... I guess I should tell you this. Let's go back to the previous slide. Best chance for success on those um, on those bald and burlap trees. That three-inch tree that you spent three hundred dollars worth at Oakland Nursery. The general rule of thumb is for each inch of caliper, three-inch tree, it's one year to get the roots back underneath that tree. Okay. Okay. So, um, all right. a couple of things that you can do. Uh, number one, apical bud pruning. Here is, this is, a, this is an, a bud, the terminal bud of an oak tree. And you can tell that it's an oak because all the buds are clustered at the tip, just like that. And I'm gonna ask you to do this. This would be a wintertime activity and early spring activity. I'm gonna ask you to knock all the side buds off, except that one big fat central one. And you're gonna do that all around that, that top cluster and down about two inches. And by doing this, again, this is called apical bud pruning. By doing this, you're only given the tree one option. That's this bud right there. This big fat bud right there. This is the one we want to grow to be the leader. We don't want one, we could have one coming out at the side. We have a slight dog leg to it, 
but as the tree gets fatter, that's okay. You won't notice it. But this big bud right here is going to be full of just potential to increase the height uh, of the plant. So we don't want these, these are called laterals here. We don't want these laterals. We don't want those vigorous growing ones out like this. It's not gonna help us. And so we're giving the tree only one option. Again, this is red oak. There's that cluster of buds. And there they are knocked off, except that big fat central one. Do you see that? Is that clear? And now this tree is probably, this tree in this slide is probably about this tall. Once that tree is, you know, above your head and you've got it planted, maybe in its, it's in its second year in your yard, you don't have to worry about that. The tree's fine. This is a hormonal problem with the tree. The tree has lost, well, again, what we call apical dominance. Um, transplanting it can shock it. It's lessened with a container grown tree. Bald and burlap, they are shocked because you've left so much of the root behind. And so by doing this pruning, you're helping to restore that apical dominance. And, and then the tree grows right after that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, say that one more time, please. Mm -hmm. Yes. You would do the opposite. Yeah, you would. You would promote those, and then probably. And, and I'm guessing here. I'll tell you right off the bat. I'm guessing, but this could be a side branch, and then I would I would potentially knock these off of the side branches so that this bud went further sideways. But again, I, I'm not sure you may want all those because those may be where the flower buds are for the fruit. So now, N is N, fertilization. All right, this is a little beech tree coming up. So to me, and, and my background, my background is I was a a chemistry teacher at Buckeye Valley for 27 years. That was my that was my first job, and it took me 50 years to figure out I wanted to be a farmer. And so we've been doing the nursery. Left left Buckeye Valley. Um, people asked, were, "Were you? Uh, did you retire?" And no, I'm a quitter. And so I quit, and uh, I haven't looked back. My friends are on the inside, and man, after you know, at these last two years, I'm so glad to be out. And they say, "Ed, you are living the life," and I, and I really am. I really am. But going back to this, N is N fertilization. Most people, many people are afraid of fertilizer because they're afraid of burning the plant. You may be surprised to learn that we fertilize the plant twice a day in the nursery. That's how we get that phenomenal growth in those oaks. And so here's how an oak grows. It's, it's an amazing thing. Those oaks will send up a story of growth, a flush of growth every month during the growing season. What limits them is the nutrition in their roots. If they have just a little bit of nutrition, you're gonna get a sad little flush of growth like you do in the springtime, which is why people say, oh, those oaks are so slow. I have had those oaks flush growth and getting two feet in two weeks, they will flush growth that they will flush new growth that fast. But you've got to supply fertilizer to them. If you don't, they're not going to grow. They're not going to grow that fast. Now, if you do it, if they flush growth approximately every month, that's four flushes. <laughs> Several years ago, I had a lady. She called. Um, she called me um, and she said, Ed, is it, is it normal to get 30 inches of growth on a new tree, a new bur oak? And I was like, and this was, she called me in July. And I said, all right, well, 30, we try to get them up to five feet in two years. So, you know, 30 inches a year, that's about what we're, that's about what we're shooting for. Yeah, 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 that's good. And so she calls me back like in August, late August. She said, Ed, we got 62 inches of new growth on a bur oak. 
in one season, she said, Ed, we didn't fertilize it at all. And I was like, holy cow, how does that happen? <laughs> and so she said, Ed, we just prepared the soil real well when we planted it. I have had red oak, not many of them, red oak seedlings go from a seed to seven feet in one year, in one growing season. Now that has started in the greenhouse. And that may have started as early as February. But when they had that, when they get that long, really long growing period from February until let's say late September, they reach exponential growth at the very end of that. So like during August, they are growing every day. We I track some of them 12 inches in nine days in a red oak. And so they just keep growing and growing. And if it was to stay hot, they would just keep growing and growing and growing. And so they are really amazing creatures. They can really grow. But again, your key is fertilizer. And so we use, we use water-soluble fertilizer, miracle Grow. It's great stuff. I'm mad at Scott's because they don't want to play with me. They want to play with big people like Lowe's and Home Depot and stuff like that. I buy fertilizer by the ton. And could, we have people at church who work for Scott's and they still won't play. And so I use a, a, a miracle Grow type product from Harold's. I mean, it doesn't, miracle Grow is great. Just mix it up to the label directions and put that on. And, and we have uh, just a, like a five gallon bucket with a little hole drilled in the bottom of it. Mix that up, it's gonna drip. It's gonna run out just a tiny little bit, like three thirty seconds inch hole, real small hole. And you just let it dribble out over the course of three or four hours. And then it sinks down into the roots rather than washing off like you would if you were there with a hose end sprayer. And so, if you did that once a month, at the beginning of the month, I would do that from the beginning of May till about the time, till right, right now, till about the time the kids go back to school. Go. I am setting a, I, because that bucket has about a 12 inch diameter, I could, I could run that, I could run that, that bucket right next to the, the trunk. And so, you could drill that hole right in the center of the bucket or at the edge of the bucket, doesn't matter where. But you know, uh, I would, my, my thinking is I would, I would orient that hole so that it's closer, closer to the trunk. What I don't use are those tree spikes that you pound in the ground because, <laughs> because when you pound it in the ground, there's no guarantee there's any roots there that the tree, any of the tree roots there for them to use the fertilizer. So my suggestion is take that same hammer and beat the heck out of that, that tree spike and then sprinkle that around. And then that way you're sure as it melts in, you're sure to contact some roots and it's sure to do some good. So um, you would want a, a fertilization. The numbers aren't important. You've just got to give them something. Even if it's composted, Horse manure, chicken manure, that's going to be helpful. Remember, these plants, these burr oaks, these oaks in general, they want nutrition. They need it. If they don't get it, they're not going to grow well. The other, um, the other type of fertilization that you could use is something called a controlled release fertilizer, a CRF. And that material is expensive, but you just use a few grams of it. We use, a, um, we use a, a, a product, it's called Floricane, and we use like, half, like, like a, a, a spray paint lid, a, spray, a can of spray paint, the lid on it, half of one of those per tree, sprinkle it around. Now that control release fertilizer, it has, there'll be a, a time with it. For example, the stuff we use is 140 days. And so you put that on in May, 140 days later, that's mid-September. And so you think to yourself, well, shoot, I fertilize this thing all season long. And you have, it's just not enough. And so basically what we do is we put that on in May and about halfway through, which is about the 4th of July, hit it again. And then it all tails out over the course of August and September. And by the time the snow flies, there's nothing there and the tree goes dormant like it should. Yes. Yes. 
you know what it it is it is um and there are there are instructions on the bag to do that uh to judge that and so you would um and that is going to be the amount of fertilization i believe in like a square foot based on square foot and so i would sort of get a guesstimate of how big the drip line is you know where the drip line is under the canopy get an estimate of 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 how much is there how much surface area is there and then base that uh, base your application rate on that. That's what I would do with those. Now, in the nursery, it's easy because if they say a three gallon pot, yeah, Ed, you put 40 grams on it. And, and so then we have a little scoop that scoops out 40 grams each time. And so you've got to give them fertilization. You know what? I think this, I think that these plants will benefit from a fertilized a fertilizer program that is more than just designed to get them up and above, you know, deer deer browse height and deer rubbing bright uh, deer uh, uh, rubbing height and rabbits. All these trees are going to benefit from that. And so, if you have a lawn service who puts on fertilizer, that helps. That helps. And again, for us. In the, in the nursery, it gets it twice a day. And so it's not the frequency that is, is a problem, but if you put too much on, as you, as you might imagine, put too much on, then that's when you get in trouble. We've never burned our trees, even putting, you know, even putting it on twice, uh, twice a day. All right, so now we start getting into the fun part. Local fauna eats local flora. And so this is why, this is the first reason, a first reason, not the first reason, a little bit. This is the first reason why we do native trees. This is, these are two fantastic caterpillars uh, of, an, of an imperial moth. These things get humongous, like approaching hot dog size. They're gigantic. And here you see two different morphs, two different forms of their caterpillars. There's a brown one, and then or there's a brown one, the lower one, then the other one is a little bit darker. It also has a yellow morph and a brilliant green form. And so they're just the prettiest things. They've got this fur all over them. They're just cool. And they, they sort of recline in this position. So as I presume, so it's not to be recognized by predators. And so this is how, this is how they spend a lot of their time. It's like bent back like that. And so they're just, they're just beautiful. And so at our house, we have caterpillar socks. They are net, uh, netted bags with drawstrings at each end. They're about the size of a pillowcase. And so then we grow these uh, over the course of the summer. There's a guy from here, from Westerville. His, uh, his name is Kevin Clark. He drives up. He brings me eggs every year and we put them out on the trees. He'll bring adults. He'll let them go in my yard. He is a terrific amateur entomologist and I'm, I'm entomology at OSU. And I think, my gosh, that guy knows tons more than I ever, than I ever did. And so at the open house this, this coming weekend, it's actually a, it's actually a nursery hop. There's two nurseries that are involved. There's mine, and then there's the one uh, leaves for wildlife in Sunbury. And Kevin is going to be at the Sunbury site. And he's bringing some of his big honking caterpillars. And oh, yeah, they're humongous. They are humongous. And so uh, he's interesting. He's well, he just knows his bugs. And uh, he just gets um, uh, all excited uh, about growing these creatures. And so he's... Uh, um, he, he's, he's very interesting. So this, uh, these caterpillars turn into this fantastic bug. And this fantastic bug may have a wingspan like this. All right, and they fly hard. These are hard flying moths. And this is our, this is our imperial moth. I mean, purple and yellow. What a beautiful color combination in a bug, in a bug. Now this is, this is like the holy grail of caterpillardom to the entomology person. This is the hickory horn devil. 
And so it's like eight to 10 inches long. It is humongous and it's completely harmless. I brought some of these home. We were driving down in Wayne National Forest when I was in college. And I we're just driving along and I said, stop the car. And I ran out and on a little, on a little uh, hickory, three of these monstrous caterpillars were, were feeding. I gathered them up, took them, took them to my apartment there on campus. My mom came down the next weekend. I'm like, look at these cool bugs I have here. And she burst into tears. And so she was afraid of them. They're completely harmless. They're completely harmless. These horns, these projections here, are thought to help them brush away parasitoids that may try to land on them, sting them, lay an egg inside of them, and then have their, have their larva, have their grub feed on them from the inside out. So yeah, a terrific, terrific caterpillar. The best one we have in North America and probably the largest one as well. Here is, here is the adult hickory horned devil. It's a royal walnut moth. And again, a big moth, probably wingspan like this. Hard flying moth. These, these, um, these caterpillars, these two species of caterpillars, the um, imperial moth here and the hickory horned devil here, they pupate underground. They do not spin a cocoon. And so they walk down the tree, they walk across the yard, and this is why you see them in the fall because they're on the move. They're looking for a place to pupate. And so if you, if you have landscape fabric underneath your trees, you're, you're breaking that, that, that interface between the creatures above the ground and where they're trying to get. They can't get through that. So that makes it more difficult for them. Here is a uh, cecropia moth. Uh, here, my daughter's holding them. They're like pets at our house. And so uh, these feed on uh, bur oaks. We feed them on bur oaks, a river, uh, river birch. We have some ashes still in the yard that eat all that stuff. This turns into a big, big, big moth that looks like this. And just beautiful bugs, beautiful bugs. And so there is here a male and a female. And so the way you tell the difference, and it's not, this, this slide doesn't show that all that well, but large feathery antennas on the males for sifting the air because she puts out a scent when she's ready to mate. And so he flies into that scent. And as it gets more, more and more concentrated, he knows he's getting closer. She, on the other hand, here's her antenna right there. Real thin, real thin. In here, I mean, here's her rear. She is loaded with eggs. Him, he's much slimmer. None of these, none of these moths feed as adults. They don't even have a mouth. They feed on, or they live on the stored energy that the caterpillar ate the season before. Yes? No, no, no. All they are are egg dispersal units. And so she may have 300 eggs in there. And so her job is to get those laid. And she may have 10 days to do it before she's just spent or something eats her first. And so what we do with those is we've got the cuckoos. I, and I meant to bring some duck on it. I left them at home. I've got, I've got probably half a dozen cocoons at home from caterpillars that we, that we, that we grew out this, this summer. And so when we have a female, we put her in the screened in porch. My wife is a saint. Put her in the screened in porch. The air blows through. The male's fine, or they come and bounce off the bounce off the screen, and then we go out and grab them, put them in there. They find her, they mate. Then we put her in a lunch bag, like a brown paper lunch bag, or an old Kroger bag that was paper. She lays some of her eggs on the inside, and then I've got my next generation of caterpillars to mess with. And then I let her go, and she she finishes her job out there. This is a Luna moth caterpillar. Again, just not a real big caterpillar, maybe as big as your thumb, but it turns into this. Uh, one of the prettiest butterflies in North America, or moths in North America. Two, uh, two broods, two families, if you will. During the course of a summer, there's a spring brood 
And then there's a fall brood um, and, uh, or I should say there's a, there's a spring brood and then there's a summer brood. And then when they lay those eggs, uh, well, they, uh, the summer brood goes through the winter um, in a cocoon. Polyphemus, here feeding on pin oak, again, oaks. Uh, another good sized caterpillar, it's amazing. I see these, they're almost impossible to spot in a tree. They just, they are exactly, look exactly like the leaves they're with. I mean, even this, even these yellow, I mean, the leaf formation right there, it's the same shade of yellowish green. They blend in perfectly. You know how we find them? They're poop on the driveway. They, their droppings are huge. Their droppings are like the size of a pea in these, in these large caterpillars. And so when I see that on the, on the driveway, I know, I know somebody's up there. And so then I try to, try to figure out where that's at by where it's most concentrated just to see who's up there. But a big, uh, a big beautiful moth. Um, here a male with those big feathery antennas. And these are thought to be eye spots to uh, potentially scare away a, a predator. But uh, again, a bug that does not eat at all in the adult stage. And once they, I mean, if you think about it, their longest stage is holed up in that cocoon from the fall until early spring of the next year. So, so we do this, uh, we open up this little segment with, with these bugs. This is the, the first reason that we, that we do this is, and again, no specific order, two main reasons. The first one being is to feed insects like this. Insects like this are going to form the basis, part of the basis of the food chain that's in your yard. If you have these caterpillars feeding in your yard, there are gonna be birds there looking for them. And so by providing local genetics, uh, local native species of trees, you're setting the table for these caterpillars and they will find it and the birds will find them. And you know, people want birds. They're not gonna get every single caterpillar. And so that's just the way it works out. And this is how you bring wildlife to your yard. I mean, the, the uh, I'm just thinking about, just trying to think of some, some trees that, um, that are out there. You know, if you have anything that's Japanese, like uh, Japanese Zelkova or Chinese Elm, there isn't anything here in the U.S. that's going to eat any of that. They're just not adapted to do that. And so those plants are worthless as far as uh, some of our indigenous species of insects. And even with caterpillars the size of a hot dog or a bratwurst, the female only ever lays a couple of eggs on the tree at a time. If she laid more than that, the, the, the parasites would find them and they'd be gobbled up by, or they'd be gobbled up by birds. And so the, the damage that they do is entirely cosmetic. It doesn't hurt your tree to lose upwards of 10% of its leaves. And so we can spare those. We can spare those for these creatures. And then also, here's the second reason why we do this is because we want to have kids like this. We have kids out there with their nets running around catching bugs and enjoying, um, enjoying the, you know, just the diversity of the stuff that's out there, bringing stuff to you and say, Hey, look, mom and dad, grandma, and grandpa, look what I caught. What is this? And this was, <laughs> this, this is me. This was me when I was a kid, I was the kid with the net going out catching butterflies and um, all that good stuff, being in the creek, catching crayfish, all that stuff. That's what I did. And uh, of course, there were no video games back then. <laughs> but um, but this, is, uh, this is what I did. And to me, this is a far superior way to go, far superior way to, to, to raise kids out in the field, doing fun stuff like this. But to me, they're counting on you. Um, to give them this opportunity. So thank you. And if you have some questions, I am ready. Yes, ma'am. Yes. 
not with any of these, not with any of these. I would have, uh, if I saw them, I'd be all excited and I'd be out there every day watching, seeing what they're doing with these species. Now you've seen the tent caterpillars. You've seen the, the fuzzy things that are in the tops of the trees. I always cut those out or rip that down. Um, yeah, I, I, that's, that's too many. And so, yeah, but you know what? I can't think of, aside from those tent caterpillars or those fall web worms, whatever they are up there, um, those are the only ones that I, that I would intervene on. I mean, that I have intervened on. Uh, again, the rest of this is, is cosmetic. And even with the trees that, that, we, that we have in the yard that serve as, as hosts for these caterpillars, I might grow 50 caterpillars in that bag. And so when I change them out, there's not a leaf left in that bag, they've eaten everything down. Now there's still more on the tree, but I don't mind moving it to another portion of the tree. Even 50 caterpillars isn't that big of a deal for me. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Well, um, right now, the, the only way that that would happen the only way that would happen is if you had a leak in that line. And so those, those oak trees are not going to be able to penetrate, if you will, that water line, that gas line, that gas line presumably being metal or plastic. If, if, if it did, you would, you would have problems because there would be water gushing out. You would have gas gushing out. There would be a dead area there. Um, now, if you have some drain tile or septic, I think you have issues. But those underground utilities, I would, I would keep them away. I would be more concerned digging into those underground utilities because they always tell you, you know, call the oops people so you know where all that stuff is. And then I, that, to me, these, these plants have roots that go down. They're not surface roots like on those oaks. And so they are not going to penetrate that. They're going to grow around that. And they're not going to bring that up. But if this was going into a septic field, which in that in those septic lines, the the tile is perforated, those roots are going to go in there because there's good stuff in there that they would love to get to, and that's not the case, however, for your utilities. Something else? Yes. Uh, you know what? For, for, my, for my product, which again is a container grown product, for my product, you could plant any time, any time the soil is not frozen. That's the only limitation. Now, the, the Columbus Metro Parks, they, they have purchased stuff for me and have taken delivery after Thanksgiving because the trees are really dormant. And they run into problems because if it freezes, then the trees are frozen in their pots, which makes them really hard to get out. And so they've had to warm them up on the tailpipe of, of a vehicle. And that just really slows things down. But, 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 because you're getting most of the, most of the roots the tree ever grew, your transplant shock is, is minimized. If you planted in the middle of a hot summer, like it was, you know, two weeks ago, I would watch it and I would make sure if I saw leaves flagging, they're wilting, I put water on it. And for me, when I look at that ground and I see that the ground is dark right around where the tree was planted, then I know there's moisture in the ground. And so I'm okay with that. Now, if it's as dry as the rest of the yard, well then this tree is gonna be hurting. But overall, uh, fall, and into winter uh, are good times to plant that way, in my opinion. If you were to plant now, and let's just say it's not gonna get hot again. If you were to plant now, there's still plenty of time for these trees to set root and to get some root growth to anchor them in so they don't get heaved out of the ground by the freeze thaw cycles during the winter. If you, and then that way, when, when it finally does get cold, they go dormant. And then as soon as the first hints of warmth start to come along, those roots are gonna grow. And I'd like to see those, those trees planted and, and sort of established before that. And so now oh, into November, into December, 
I think are good times. You start getting into March. Well, it's, it's, you know, they're already starting to think about, about coming out of their dormancy. And so uh, the, the, that newest growth can be delicate. And I'd rather them be in the ground when that newest growth comes out. Yes, ma'am. Uh, no, but you know what, I, and if I was to, and again, my, my thing is to try, my idea here is to try and let nature, nature be my guide. Um, I think they look better if there is a, sort of a shrub understory layer. And for shrubs, I might look at some shrug, shrub forming dogwoods um, that get lots of berries, get lots of flowers. Uh, the birds are the birds are eating them right now, like uh, silky dogwood or gray dogwoods grow well. We have beautiful, fabulous um, black aronia uh, that has a beautiful fall color. Oh, they're so pretty in the fall. Um, and you know, uh, hazel is nice um, for wetter areas. I love buttonbush. Buttonbush is beautiful, and it gets a white puffy flower on it. The butterflies just mob it. So if you have like a edge of a pond or or a wet area, you know, a, a hole or a depression in your yard where maybe it holds a little bit of water, and I put I put a button bush in there in in a heartbeat, and maybe a sycamore as well, and then grow that out. And you know, so many people come. Well, we've got to tile this area, Ed. It's so wet, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, we have so many great plants that you can put in there that love it wet. So. Uh, winterberry holly, brilliant. The female plants get brilliant red fruit um, in uh, late October. It's, the, it's really a showstopper. They're just beautiful. So, uh, so yeah, there's plenty. There's lots of options. Wet, dry, sun, shade, and that's just the trees. And with the perennials, uh, you know, we're just learning that. I mean, people come out and they say, hey, Ed, what does this do? And I'd be like, you know, I don't know. <laughs> not sure. <laughs> not sure. They're growing real well, but I'm really not sure how they're what they're going to do here. We have tons of milkweeds out there, uh, swamp milkweeds and different milkweeds that love it dry, love it wet, sun, someone shade. So uh, there's there's a lot of options again for wildlife, and that are beautiful too. So. That's all right. <clears throat> a black oak. Mm -hmm. So why would you think that they wouldn't, something wouldn't survive? Okay, so, all right, so um, the, the, the oaks do not, like, for instance, um, now we're talking about black oak or black walnut? Okay, black walnuts. All right, so um, let me see. Let me see what I got here. I did this. I know exactly what you're saying. Sorry about this, people out there and Mr. and Mrs. America and all the ships at sea. Don't close that one? Okay. Oh, they were lucky. All right. So if we go to Google Chrome and let's go to the thought is this the university, uh, Cornell University. Cornell University came out with a list of the trees that do well with black walnuts versus the trees that don't do well or the plants that don't. The list of trees that do well, about twice as long as the list, the list of plants that do well, about twice as long as the list of plants that don't do well. Morton Arboretum, here. Close that. So uh, here, is, here is information about that. And, um, and so if you go over here, this is the list. Again, Morton Arboretum, uh, black walnut toxicity. Here's trees that are tolerant of that. Morton, like Morton salt. Yep. So these trees, which some of them you certainly uh, you certainly recognize, are okay with it. And uh, the ones that are sensitive, and again, there's a whole bunch of them there. The ones that are sensitive to the jug loan, not not nearly as many as as most people think. But at any rate, that's uh, 
That's what I know. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you. Thanks for inviting me in. Thank you for, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your interest. Um, if there's anything that, uh, any questions you may have, you, you can call me or uh, email me through the website. And, um, and I'd be happy to, happy to field any, any of your questions.